All right, in this video, I wanna talk about the basics of carbon-13 NMR, okay? So I'm assuming we have our, our basic knowledge of how proton NMR works. And if you remember talking about proton NMR, there were four basic things we needed to know about NMR or proton NMR, right? We talked about the number of signals that you can find, the chemical shift, the location on where you can find those signals, and then integration and splitting. So when we're talking about uh, carbon-13 NMR, what's really nice about this is we don't have to worry about integration at all, right? We can't integrate our peaks of carbon-13, or we don't. And the spectrum we really collect are decoupled, so you don't have to worry about splitting. So when we focus on carbon-13 NMR, there's really only two basics we have to understand. That's counting the correct number of signals and the location of those signals where they're going to be. So we can ignore integration and ignore splitting, all right? So let's just first talk about the number of signals. Again, we're, we're focusing on carbon-13 NMR, so we're simply counting non-equivalent carbon atoms, okay, non-equivalent carbon atoms. The key here is really focusing on if the molecule has any symmetry. So the first example, there's really no symmetry here. So if we count, we have one, two, three, four, five different carbon atoms. So this would show five signals in our carbon-13 spectrum. Spectrum, Okay. Um, if we looked at something like this, All right, so if we look at this molecule here, one thing we can notice is that we have some branching at those ends. Those two carbons are going to be equivalent because they're attached to the same carbon. So here we would see one, two, three, right? We can't see an O. We can't forget the carbon of the carbonyl, four, five, six. So that structure would have six signals in your carbon-13 spectrum, okay? We always want to just keep out, keep our eye out for symmetry. So what about a molecule like this, diethyl ether? Well, what we have to remember is this molecule is symmetric. We have an ethyl group on the left connected to an O, also an ethyl group on the right connected to the O. Those are equivalent, all right? So here we would only see two signals in our spectra, right? Because the left basically matches the right. So our carbon-13 spectra would only show two signals, all right? Let's look at another example. Let's take a molecule like toluene here, molecule like toluene. Again, we have symmetry, right? There's a line of symmetry. So these two carbons on the left match the carbons on the right, all right? So if we look, count how many non-equivalent signals we would see, one from our um, allylic carbon, and then four on the, the aromatic ring. One, two, three, four. So here we would, we would see a total of five signals in our carbon-13 spectrum. And let's look at one more example here. There's a high level of symmetry in this example here. So I'm drawing a benzene ring with two bromines. Okay, so there's a lot of symmetry here. First, the left side is exactly like the right side. Okay, so we can see that those are equivalent with each other, right? But also, the top and the bottom are also symmetric as well, right? So it turns out, in this here, we would only see two signals in our carbon-13 spectrum. You would only see two signals because you have so much symmetry. So I'm just going to kind of highlight this. This carbon here in red is a carbon attached to a bromine. Right, there's one signal in red, and the other signal in green, right, all of these are exactly the same, right, they're in between a green and a red, right, so here you would only see two signals. So that's the first thing we need to do is be able to count the number of signals and the number of non-equivalent carbons. Next is really looking at our chemical shift, right, and that's pretty easy because what we do is we really look at our chemical shift table, right? So here we have a chemical shift table. This is from our Morig textbook, okay? 
a chemical shift table. So let's kind of just go through this table and investigate what we'd see. Okay, the first thing we want to look at is when we have alkenes. So that's just an sp3 carbon, right? An sp3 carbon that's connected to other, right, to other carbons or hydrogens via a single bonds. Okay, so anytime you just have regular sp3 carbons connected to other sp3 carbons or hydrogens, this is going to have a range that comes from about 8 to about 40. 8 to 40. Okay, so that's the first, first chemical shifts we should be aware of. And one thing to be aware about, our, our table, our, our C13 NMR table, that really goes from about 0 all the way up to about 220. So this is a much larger range than what we see with carbon. It usually goes up to like 10 or 12 ppm. But now we're going from a range of 0 to about 220 ppm. All right. So the first thing we looked at was our alkenes. There's some more specific examples here, right? So if we zoom in, <coughs> if you have a carbon that's connected to an sp2 carbon, right, whether that's an alkene or an aromatic ring, you get a little more specific here. That's 20 to about 45. Or again, a carbon connected to a carbon of a carbonyl, right? But we can kind of, these are going to be pretty close to what we see with our, our, our alkenes. Okay, so we don't really need to worry about that much detail. You can, you can drill in a little bit more if you want to, but I think sort of the highlighted, the highlighted boxes are really most important here. All right, next if we go down, if we have any ethers, alcohols, or esters, anytime we have an sp3 hybridized carbon with a single bond to an oxygen, right, that's going to have a range of about, let's call that about 55 to about 80, right? So that's about 55 to about 80. That's a C double bond to an O, all right? Next, we can look at amines. We can look at amines. So if we have a C with a single bond to N, a C with a single bond to N, that'll have a range of about 30 to about 70, 30 to 70. That's a C single bond to N. Next is our halogens, right? Our C to X, right? C to X bonds. So our alkyl iodides, our C to O, that can go from about, you know, negative four or so up to about 45. Okay. Alkyl bromides, right? C to BR, that'll have a range of about 25 to about 65. Alkyl chlorides, right, we can see here, that's going to be about 35 to about 70, right? I'm just looking at the range of these different boxes. And then our, fluoride, our fluorides are about 80 to about 95. Okay, so these are all our halogens, just giving you a good idea of the ranges on where we would find, right, the carbon atoms attached. All right. Next, we want to investigate alkynes. So now we're looking at our sp hybridized carbons, sp hybridized carbons. So those are going to come from about 68, around 68 or so to about 100, right? 68 to about 100. Those are sp hybridized carbons, okay, when you have an alkyne. Next, important are alkenes. Right, alkenes. So when we have an sp2 hybridized carbon connected to another sp2 hybridized carbon, that'll have a range of about 110 to about 150. 110 to about 150. And then when we have aromatic carbons, right here we're talking about carbons that are on benzene rings, right? Carbons here. So those are, are pretty important, aromatic compounds. So if we highlight this box here, we see again that has a range of about 110 and that goes to about 160, right? So here we're about 160 to about 110, all right? Those are sp2 hybridized carbons that are aromatic, all right? Uh, a little less common, but again, you can look at nitriles here. So when you have an sp hybridized carbon connected to a nitrogen, 
right? That has a range from, again, about 110 here to about 128, I'd say, 110 to 128. The, the last ones to really look at are our compounds that are carbonyls. So here we have C double bond O, our carbonyls, right? And these are pretty common. So if you have a ketone, a ketone would have a chemical shift value of about 220 to about 190. So the C double bond O of a ketone is about 220 to about 190. The C double bond O of an aldehyde, the C double bond O of an aldehyde, right? That would have a chemical shift value a little bit lower here. So that's going to be about a 185 to about 210. 185 to 210. And then last but not least, if you have a carboxylic acid, an ester, or an amide, again, we're looking at that SP two hybridized carbon of the carbonyl, when that's carbonyl is a carboxylic acid, ester, or amide, our range here is about 160 to about 180, all right? So this table is a, a, just gives you a good rough idea on where the chemical shifts of the different carbon atoms will come, okay? And this is, again, from the Morig textbook. So if we sort of look at uh, this example here, if we look at toluene, we said we were going to see five signals here. Right, so we have a CH3, the benzylic position connected to an aromatic ring, and then we have, so that would be carbon one, and then we have uh, four signals on the aromatic carbons, right? So what would that spectrum look like? We would see really one peak, right, from about 20 to 45, one peak from 20 to 45, and then we would see four signals in the aromatic region from about 110 to 160, all right? That's what we'd see if we're from the structure of toluene. All right, so that's really all I wanted to cover, just some basics of carbon-13 NMR, really focusing on the number of signals and the chemical shift.